Okay, thank you very much for being here. Today's speaker is Brian Kunkel from the University of Delaware. He's an extension specialist there in the Department of Entomology. Um, thank you, Brian, very much for speaking to us today and take it away. All right, well, thanks for having me. Um, today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about the uh, infamous uh, red-headed flea beetle. Uh, it depends, some locations have this particular pest, others do not. Um, the subtitle here, the native invasive, is something that I kind of refer to it as. It's not really official. However, we do believe that the redhead flea beetle uh, is native to the United States, probably coming from the Midwest, like Iowa. At least that's where some of the earliest work was done with this insect. Um, it has an incredibly broad host range for being a flea beetle. It uh, was first studied in corn um, in Iowa and also in potatoes and blueberries up in Maine. Uh, Wisconsin has looked at it a lot uh, in cranberry bulbs. So it will feed on a variety of pests. And I was at a meeting recently where they were talking about this insect and still being a problem in cranberries. Uh, it goes all the way from uh, Quebec and Canada, all the way down south into Alabama. Um, and as far west, I've heard reports into uh, Michigan, uh, western Tennessee, Memphis. Um, so it has a wide range geographically that it can be found. And the reason why some people may have it, some may not. You, it seems like it potentially can move around in pot in, in the pots or containers that go from one nursery to another. So scouting or inspecting plant material is important if you buy plants from one nursery to grow out on your own. So here's just a list of some places I've heard or talked to people where they're having problems just a small sample of hosts that they feed upon. I'll leave that there a second, so just in case. And you'll notice Pennsylvania smartweed, everybody's growing that as a crop, obviously, um, but it is a very common weed here in the Mid-Atlantic, and it's been documented to feed on that particular weed a lot, as well as a number of other weed species. And so also the amount of weeds you have within the business operation that you manage could play a small role uh, in terms of your uh, flea beetle populations. And I'll talk about that uh, towards the end of today's presentation. Here's a, in case you have not seen it, this is an example of some redheaded flea beetle damage. Um, if the leaf is particularly tough or thick, they will chew on the upper or lower surface of that particular leaf and not necessarily go all the way through, which then the plant leaf uh, dries out and turns brown, making these divots in the foliage. On your thinner leaves, they can chew all the way through. Um, when the adults come out and feed, they definitely will do uh, most of their feeding down in those new shoot growth tips that are putting out foliage. They seem to like sit down in there. Um, it's kind of protected and not easy to get at them. And there may be some nutritional issues there that they're attracted to. We're trying to investigate that as a possibility. Problem with redhead flea beetles, you look at ITEA, it is one of their more preferred plants that they will feed on, especially in the spring. Um, adults love to feed on this. Uh, foliage can look quite ratty after a generation or even just after a weekend if the population is really, really hot. The problem is, is if you go to buy this plant um, or ship it from your nursery to someone else that's going to put it into a larger container and then sell it themselves. Looking at this plant, you wouldn't know necessarily that there are larvae in that root ball. 
The larvae are frequently found in the root balls of potted plants and they'll feed what we guess to be feeding on roots and potentially other organic matter that's in that potting media. Um, but they don't cause any observable damage to the plant, to the visible portion of the plant. So you've got a pot, potted plant that looks nice, it's in good color, it's in bloom. And you think it's fine and you send it off and whoever receives it, if it's another nursery, uh, they think they're in good shape. And then those larvae pupate come out and they don't begin to feed on the foliage. So as we look at this picture, you can obviously see that the larvae aren't easy to locate. Um, but we found that so far the best way to scout for populations is to pull the root ball and spin it around, sorry, and uh, see if you can find a larva crawling around on the outside. Um, through experience, we found that this is, you have better results if you do this 15 minutes or so after the plants have been irrigated, uh, because the insect seems to like to go into the root ball when it's exposed to light or really dry. And so if you irrigate, give enough time for that water to permeate through the pot and through that potting media, the insect becomes a little active and then seems to crawl around in that interface between the soil ball and the edge of that rim of that pot. Um, and so you can pull them out and you can see a couple in there. If you have one or two on the outside of the root ball, you potentially could have quite a few more on the inside of that root. So one of the, when I first started working with this, nobody had done anything with it, and it was hit or miss for scouting or when to scout. So there's a number of different ways that we tried to, well, a couple of different ways. Growing degree days and keeping track of those um, so that we're aware of when flea beetles are active, uh, larvae and adults. Um, problem with growing degree days is when you start uh, monitoring for or accumulating growing degree days. Here in the Mid-Atlantic at Delaware, we started our growing degree day accumulations on March 1st. And through conversations, I know a lot of people down south will often begin the growing degree day accumulations uh, beginning with January 1. Um, there are a number of websites now that uh, weather stations will have historical data where you can go back and back calculate if you hadn't been doing so. Um, or they may have running totals for you. Generally, we run with a base of 50 degrees Fahrenheit for calculating. One thing to keep in mind is if you've got an overly shaded location or a area that's out in the fully exposed sun, the growing degree days accumulated in the full sun location is going to be different than the growing degree days in an area that is shaded just because it's based off the temperatures and the highs and lows in those particular locations. So if you're going with a flat growing degree day number, um, then realize if you're in a sunnier location, or in the case of North Carolina, you're a little further south than us, your 232 growing degree days, which is also when we can see redhead flea beetles uh, larvae begin acting. Um, usually it's closer to three or four hundred. Um, we'll see them quite active. Uh, that will be earlier in the year for you all down south compared to us here in Delaware. Uh, and then obviously uh, if you have extreme temperatures that could play a role in the insect development as well. We also realize that temperatures can be a little bit uh, growing degree days can fluctuate from site to site or location to location. So we also tried to compare it with uh, plant phenology of nearby landscape plants uh, for when some of those are active. Um, for example, you can have good larval activity when black locust is in full bloom. Um, you may also have uh, azaleas uh, in bloom if you're further south uh, where you have larvae in the root balls 
active colon and being about. With other insect pests, phenology can be a bit of a challenge because we don't have every single pest matched up to landscape plants and their phenology. Plus, in the middle of the summer, it's harder to find plants in different, easily identifiable phenological growth stages to compare to that pest activity. So that's also part of the challenge. With this particular insect, one reason why I mentioned the uh, larval stages in the root balls is because it could be a potential target area for management by not using your uh, traditional insecticide. Um, things like entomopathogenic nematodes. There's a number of different species that you can occasionally find more or less available in the industry. Uh, they have different infectivity behaviors that help them search out particular soil dwelling insect pests. Um, Heteragis bacteriophora and Steinonema carpocapsi are two very commonly found um, nematode species. The others I have listed here can be a little more challenging to find or if you find a supplier whether they have enough product on hand to be able to distribute on a large basis and sometimes the populations will fluctuate. Um, but H. bacteriophora and Steinium macarpocapsi are almost always pretty commonly available. Bacteriophora is a cruiser, meaning it will move throughout the soil profile looking for insects um, or hosts to infest. Carpocapsi is an ambusher, meaning it sits and waits for that insect pest to crawl past. Ambushers typically work better against mobile insects, and cruisers typically work better against those that insect pests that are more sedentary. Um, felty eye is what we consider an intermediate. It exhibits some cruising behavior, but it will also sit and wait for an insect host to come by for it to ambush. So it can have some applicability for mobile insects or for those that are more sedentary. It just trials need to be done to see if it works with them. Whether well, basically work is to get in through the mouth, anus, or spiracles of the insect, release a bacterium that works in conjunction with the nematode to kill the insect. And the nematode feeds on this bacterial filled soup of decaying insect tissues that are highly nutritious. They have a couple generations within there, and as that nutritional soup um, declines or becomes less available for the nematode, they enter a stage called an infected juvenile, in which then they leave the host, which we see over here. Feeding a couple generations, they end up leaving in search of new hosts. Part of the problems with nematodes is how you're going to get them out efficiently and effectively. Um, it's best not to do it at the beginning of the day because you're maximizing the opportunity to UV exposure, which can kill them. They also will dehydrate if they are left out on foliage um, and they're not put, uh, applied with something that will help keep them hydrated long enough to get them into the soil profile. What type of containers would you use? On small scale, you could do use watering buckets or canisters like you see here. Um, you could also try traditional spray equipment that remove the nozzles so that they don't get shredded when they go through. Um, Beginning to cloudy days where there's limited sunshine would be a better day. Uh, or late in the evening as the sun is going down to make applications in that regard. Here's an example of a wax worm that was infected by H. bacteriophora turned to orange, and you can see the vast number of nematodes that come out that can go search for alternate hosts after that one has been used to its uh, full potential. I've mentioned um, larval activity. When would you want to be putting these nematodes out? You'd want to be trying to put them out somewhere in the window between 250 and 400 growing degree days, uh, if at all possible. 
Um, same way if you're going to use a traditional soil applied insecticide that was trying to target the larvae. You'd want to be applying it when you're going to have exposure to larvae. You wouldn't want to put it out too late because you may miss the boat for that. Um, uh, but you also don't want to put it out too early and potentially have it um, leach out or degrade through microbial action or uh, any a number of things that can uh, lead to reduce the efficacy of insecticide uh, in, in a soil media. Uh, so trying to target that window, and I have it here in the upper right hand corner, at, at least wait until 242, I'd say 250 or in pretty good shape, maybe 260. And then out to 400, you're probably okay. Uh, with the, getting as nematodes out for soil applied insecticide. For best results though, it should be, if you can scout through those like a week later to see if you're seeing any activity of that, of that particular insect. Here's an example of a close-up of what a red-headed flea beetle looks like. Here you can see the aerogomphi that are off the terminal end or the posterior end. It's uh, almost like a thumb sticking out, like it's hitchhiking. Um, it is different uh, from fungus gnats. Uh, some people will get them confused as fungus gnats. But this has a really easy to identify tannish brown head capsule. And occasionally you will see what looks like a stream of red blood running down the back of the insect or along the side as we see in this picture here. Um, so that erogonthus or that that sticks off the back, that fleshy appendage off the back, um, and that tannish brown head capsule are two good indicators that it's a flea beetle larvae. And if you had redheaded flea beetle, this is probably the one. Red-headed flea beetle is one of our larger flea beetles that we have, um, and it does a sizable amount of damage to plants if it's left untreated. Um, so that you have some frame of reference, uh, I have a scale in this picture as well. It's two millimeters or a fifth of a centimeter. So they're pretty, relatively pretty small. You're looking at maybe a centimeter and a half in length. But no more than two centimeters, so not even an inch in length when the uh, third inch size. This is a nice picture by Mac Return. I am sure that you all are well aware who he is. Um, NC State is doing some really cool work with a number of you all down there, which is great. Anybody that can shed more light on how to address and kill this pest is wonderful. This is actually a picture of the pupae of the beetle. And these are quite small. Any work that's done with the larvae and the pupae and the pots is very tedious because you're looking for things that are a, usually a centimeter or less in size. And they frequently will look like um, root hairs or vermiculite if you're talking about the pupae. Um, they're similar in coloration. So until you get practice looking and working with them, looking for or working with them, they can be easily missed. So it takes a lot of practice and a lot of repetition. Had a grower uh, work with me in getting uh, nematodes applied and we were doing a small scale trial. So uh, he worked with us using uh, hand watering cans, making applications. Um, we made sure that when we made this application, we leached or watered in those nematodes enough so that they could make their way through the potting media. Um, when we went and evaluated 10 days later, uh, I have listed on this uh, picture here, or this uh, diagram where we were seeing most of our larvae. Um, and that generally has held true. Um, they're often, most often found in the soilless potting media that is near that uh, tightest group of roots that was in the pot, like the pro-mix style. Uh, when you first put it in those big pots, um, they're not in that pro-mix, but the roots that are coming out of there, we found a lot of larvae in those locations. So that would be right up through here. I hope you all can see my cursor move. Uh, but then 
as you go down away from there in the center portion, you generally find most of your larvae, but you can find some out on the outer edges or rims, depending on how moist the container is. Again, it's matter, it's a destructive sampling to evaluate the effective eff efficacy of soil applied insecticides or entomopathogens. We've done uh, field experiments where we looked at Bacteriophora, Feltii, and Carpocapsi. And it became difficult to find actual dead ones. So we had plants that had been infested with uh, redhead flea beetle, and they all had the same opportunity for infestation. And so we figured they all would have the baseline number of larvae in each pot. And when we, before we made treatments, we scouted to make sure that we were seeing one to two on the root ball of each plant. And we did, so then we treated it um, with the assumption that if we were seeing similar numbers on the outside of the root ball, we would see similar on the inside of the root ball across all treatments. So then we put our treatments out. What we found was we had in the carpal capsing, which is this one, this is a dark blue, uh, and this is black, which is the carpocapsi, had fewer live larvae found in pots that had been treated with carpocapsi. It wasn't significant, but you could see there's definitely a trend for that to be the case. When we looked at those number of pupae, we were finding pupae in the nematode-treated pots and the control-treated pots, with the exception of carpocapsi. We weren't finding any pupae in the carpocapsi treated pots. And we feel that a good reason for this could be the fact that carpocapsi had significantly reduced the flea beetle populations within there. When you look at the larvae combined with the pupae, um, it had significantly fewer redheaded, living redheaded flea beetle in pots treated with carpocapsi. Entomopathogenic fungi are another uh, reduced risk or um, botanical based uh, control option. Um, they are fungi that can infest soil dwelling pests. And one of the challenges for them is they need to be in areas with relative humidity that is high. And luckily, with the pots with the insects in it, and those are frequently being irrigated, usually once a day or at least a couple times a week at a minimum, which is enough for those uh, fungal spores to germinate and potentially go after larvae that are crawling by them. The entomopathogenic fungi have been used for a variety of pests. Um, they're also commonly known as the green muscadine or the white muscadine uh, fungus. Uh, Bavaria bassiana is readily available. Uh, challenges with them, again, is UV, and I mentioned the humidity. Uh, but then if you were applying fungicides to the root masses of those plants, antifungal compounds will interfere with their efficacy as well. We did a trial where we looked at the fungi in the lab and azodirac along with a number of other chemicals. And then we also compared it to a field trial. With the field trial, we busted up the root balls. Again, I said it's a destructive procedure. And here you can see two um, student uh, interns working uh, diligently to find those. What we found was that in the laboratory setting, Bavaria, which is this white bar, the first one you see here, this is the number of dead in the laboratory study we found that significantly more had died due to Bavaria treatments in the laboratory. Um, Bavaria with azodiractin was not significantly different. Um, it was similar. Metarhizium also provided significant source of mortality against flea beetle larvae in the laboratory. Um, in the laboratory, um, the control, the larvae lived well. Azodiractin by itself did not kill many. 
Um, Mainspring and Safari did have an impact, but not as great as the fungi. Um, some of that probably has to do with the fact that in the laboratory, it was product applied to just the soil, and so there was no plant uptake. Um, and so it wasn't an ideal situation for the insecticides necessarily, but it definitely was a good one for the fungi. Um, we did not include discus because it was a pellet of fertilizer and imidacloprid. Um, in the laboratory study, um, but we did use bifenzyl. Uh, in the field trial, we used all of them. Um, and we did see reduction with Bavaria, Bassiana, and Metarizium. This is just one of the studies. We did another study that I'm not presenting here, I don't believe, um, where we had significant reduction using both fungi and azurdirachtin. Um, in this study, we had a fair bit of variability, even with their control, so it made it difficult for us to be able to find anything. We did see some differences um, from some of our pots, but nothing significant from a control, which again is a black bar. No, I, did, I am presenting both of them. Here we go. So in another separate trial, which we did in Virginia, which uh, Virginia Tech and has been great in working with me on projects. NC State has also um, worked with me on some things for redhead flea beetle. Um, it's, they've been great partners for a lot of this effort to try to figure out how to address this pest. And here you can see one of the trials in Virginia, the Bavaria and the Metarizium, these first four bars um, had significant reductions against the redheaded flea beetle. We weren't finding any living or very few living redheaded flea beetle larvae in pots treated with the varia, metarizium, or azurdirac. Also, in the field, we were also seeing significant reduction of larvae found by mainspring, safari, the discus products, and by fenthrin uh, in that particular trial. And this trial, we also left those out to see how they would be impacted by flea beetle feeding when the adults came out a few, uh, a week, uh, two weeks later. And what we found is that uh, the Bavaria had a slight reduction. Um, its number of damaged leaves per eight branches on the right-hand side of this graph. Um, Bavaria, uh, and metarizium did have some reduction in the number of damaged leaves, but the two that had seemed to have the best efficacy in terms of number of damaged leaves per eight branches was the azurdirachtin and the safari. The adult generation, the first one that we have seen come active in the Mid Atlantic, was when uh, Magnolia grandiflora is in um, flower bloom swell or the flower blooms are just starting to open up uh, is frequently when we will see a lot of that activity. Another one that we will see is Ilex verticillata. We know in the full bloom uh, or just being in bloom. Um, Macrophylla can be in bloom to full bloom. It just depends on the variety of hydrangea macrophylla. Uh, growing degree days wise, we were seeing adult emergence as early as 517 growing degree days, uh, but also have seen it as late as 1,028 growing degree days for adult emergence. So it can be variable. Again, here's an example of a thick, this is a seedling, so a really thick leaf. They'll feed on that, and you can see how it just gets into the new growth chews it up and then also feeds and makes divots and other leaves as it moves about on the plant. One of the things we'll frequently do is we will use an aspirator like you see the young woman doing here, uh, sucking up uh, flea beetles to try to use in controlled studies in the laboratory. We're set up for cage studies in the greenhouse. 
um, to look at potential uh, host plant selection preferences and or uh, more controlled efficacy or a short exposure to insecticide to get a better representation of the efficacy that we can get with those. And so we'll have to go to a number of different nurseries at different times of the year to get reviews. We did an experiment where we had mainspring scimitar flagship beetle gone and a product, an older product, well, that's not an old product, expire, which isn't currently available. I mean, this is in 2016. Here we can see with foliar applications, gene application, this black bar again is the control. Mainspring did not give us the best control. Um, we had beetle gone, also provided no control. Uh, the only one that provided significant control was flagship, diamethoxin. We had reduction with a pyrethroid scimitar, but it wasn't significantly different from our control due to some variability. Had a lull in populations uh, and in between our treatments. So there was in our middle evaluation period, there was uh, no significant difference between the control and any of the treatments at all. Uh, we made another application. And what we found was that mainspring um, finally was having an impact on adult beetle feeding and reduced the amount of damage that was caused by flea beetle. Uh, but you're still getting about 5% of those plants. 5% of the foliage of the plants is being damaged. It's significantly different than the 30% that the untreated ones were having, but it's still 5%, or a little north of that. Um, the scimitar also was significantly different as the flagship was significantly different from the control. Again, the control 30%. Um, scimitar and flagship were over five, whereas flagship was up to 10% damaged foliage on those plants by then. I did another trial. This trial uh, was also conducted in Virginia, and this was in 2018. Um, instead of doing percent damage, we did an evaluation of damaged a new growth and rated it from zero to five, where five was bad um, or unacceptable for sure. It was an extreme amount of damage and where zero would be no damage. And so 14 days after the application of the insecticides that you see on the right hand side of the graph, um, the IKI is a diamide that was being evaluated um, against flea beetles here over the past uh, year and a half, two years. Um, and the VST is a new product that's coming along in the market as well. Uh, Beetle Gone is a Bavaria thuringiensis galleria. Um, it is, has worked with some other trials that have done with Japanese beetles uh, somewhat, um, depending on how much damage you can tolerate, how frequently you're making applications. Beetle gone could potentially give you protection. It just depends on what your requirements are. Um, so we included it was included in this trial. And so as you work your way across 14 days after application, um, we are seeing some successful re reduction of damage. Your plants becoming more acceptable in appearance on that new growth. Uh, by the treatments of Beetle Gone, Preferral, and Upstar Gold, which is a bifenthrin product. As we progress through the season, 18 days after application, you can still see that the Beetle Gone is giving some um, reduction from control. The control is this black bar or grayish colored bar at the end. Um, versus the beetle gone, which is this middle blue bar. This end bar is tri-star. And then here, this red one again is upstar gold. 
and still a significant reduction of damage by the bifenzaline product. And these are foliar applications. Um, 21 days, we made another application, and then 21 days after the initial application, again, this is after a second application, uh, 21 days after the first, we're seeing that this VST product um, is reducing or keeping damage lessened. Um, the Upstar Gold is still uh, the best performer in terms of overall appearance of new damage. Um, the Tristone is reducing new dam damage to new growth uh, compared to the controls. 28 days, again, Upstar Gold, um, Tristar, Perferral, uh, Beetle Gone um, are all significantly reducing the amount of damage to new growth. Um, even the diamide has reduced damage to new growth at this point. Um, we also did, we can completed the experiment shortly after 28 days. We did, it was like um, the following day, we did another reading and we got uh, an overall plant appearance. And so for overall plant appearance, this combination of this VST product, which if you wish, you can send me an email and I'd be willing to share what that product active ingredient is. Um, uh, combined with the Beetle Gone, uh, reduced the amount of damage. Um, Beetle Gone itself reduced damage. It probably would have worked better if we did more frequent applications with Beetle Gone. Um, but we weren't able to get to those plots as frequently. They often suggest every week to 10 days to make applications, and ours were not that frequent. Um, Tristar significantly had an, a, a better appearance to the plant than the control. Again, that's this bar here versus um, the control, which is this black one. And Upstar Gold had the best appearance best looking plants compared to the control, compared to the rest of them. However, the damage rating is still one. So whether or not your clients can tolerate a little bit of feeding, that is going to be on a case by case basis more than likely. One thing to note is although the adult beetles will feed and can feed heavily on plants, I have not heard of any long-term health issues of plant put in the landscape after having this feeding damage. And the flea beetle does not seem to be a problem in landscape settings. This insect seems to be an issue with the production of plants, not once it's already out in the landscape. So some of our conclusions, the entomopathogens need more work. Um, mainspring can protect foliage. It, depending on how you're looking at it, um, you can, it may last out to 28 days if it's a foliar applied. It may have different results if it's a systemic or a soil applied and the plant takes it up. We haven't evaluated that as much. There's some work there needs to be done. Um, by Fenthrin, uh, the Upstar Gold and Lambdasai Halothrin, which is scimitar, has provided um, efficacy against flea beetles, uh, but they don't last very long. Um, we've seen some efficacy with imidacloprid in the discus formulation. Um, Cyclanilatrophrol, or Cyclanilatrophrol, easy for me to say, seems like it could have activity, and we're going to try to do some more work with it. Um, I have heard from a number of growers that the cloper drenches will uh, provide suppression of flea beetles if it's made prior to flights. Um, and a lot of growers are still using acetate or carbaryl or bifenthrin as weekly applications for short residual activity and efficacy. One of the things that's very interesting is if you go through where you have a lot of hydrangeas being grown, you can have hydrangea macrophylla right next to paniculata. 
and the paniculata is heavily damaged, whereas macrophylla will have next to no damage. There are a couple of varieties of macrophylla that will get test feeding done, meaning the beetle will land there, chew on it in a couple of leaves and take off. You might be able to see a little bit of a couple of holes here and there on this one, but by and large, nothing compared to how much they chew through the foliage of paniculata. And these plants, I didn't arrange this or anything, they're just growing like this at this nursery with a work at um, all on their own. Some plants just aren't fed on as much. So we wanted to look at that. Um, so we looked at plant, some plants and did some quick and dirty walk by, easy evaluations of uh, what's re resistant and what's not. And here are some of those listed. Uh, Summer Beauty, Endless Summer, Twist and Shout, National Let's, Na Let's Dance. They seem to be resistant. Ocean, Ocean Revolution seem to be resistant uh, or not fed on. Uh, Little Lime, Fire Nice, Quick Fire, Lime Light, Vanilla Strawberry, they all seem to be fed on. Now, those are also varieties of hydrangea from both macrophylla and from paniculata. So that the susceptible ones tend to be paniculata. We did uh, side by, well, we went through and did a, observations where we counted the number of beetles we'd see on a plant for a minute, and then we'd look at the damage on those plants. And so we did that over the course of the summer uh, in 2017, 2018. And here are some of those varieties that we have listed here from minute uh, observations, and we observed 15 plants. So in June, July, we weren't seeing significant damages to the hydrangea varieties between them uh, because the populations were just starting to come out, and there was a little bit of variability going on. But you will notice that fire and ice, although it's not significant, uh, already has more damage on it in June. And that's towards the beginning of the activity. By July, it is the most heavily damaged and that holds throughout the rest of the year. Um, you can see the glowing ember, rhythmic blue and endless summer, those are all macrophylla, had significantly less damage than the vanilla strawberry, limelight, or fire and ice, which are paniculata. And then again, within the macrophylla, you'll notice that there is a little bit of feeding on some of them uh, more than others. And the example here is glowing ember takes a little bit more feeding damage than the other two varieties. Why that is, we're not sure. And so that's been some of the things I've been looking at recently. Uh, we also looked, and this was this past summer, we again looked at a couple other nurseries uh, so that we'd get a broader range of preferences, and we saw that paniculata still is damaging the plants more than macrophylla uh, generally, and then we also looked at hydrangea serrata, and that one also did not seem to be fed on very much. We looked at comparisons between Blue Hill and Snow Hill, salvia, number of beetles that were the same in June, by July, predominantly on Snow Hill, and then towards the end of the year, it didn't matter which variety of salvia it was, beetles were on both. 2017, same sort of thing. Uh, damage 2017, as you would expect, no differences. Um, in June, you had no differences, so the damage of beetles, so the damage was similar. July had significantly more on Snow Hill than you did on Blue Hill. In September, the amount of damage found on Blue Hill was not much different than Snow Hill, mainly because that damage had already occurred and those plants looked poorly. The amount of damage to occur on Blue Hill could only go up. So the change in difference of damage would probably be significant if I evaluated it there. I did not know it was just in total amount of damage on those plants. But you can obviously see that in Blue Hill, the beetles were feeding more on those plants because there's more plant material to actually eat. 
we looked at uh, preferences in 2019, and what we found is damage um, was, and this was done in August, damage was predominantly on Blue Hill uh, compared to May night and Snow Hill, other varieties of salvia. And some growers have told me that they think that the beetle will change its preferences from one type to another throughout the growing season. And so why that is, you do not know. I looked to see if there were any differences on ITEA last year, and this was done in um, July, August timeframe. Um, and then also towards the end of August, beginning of September, and we saw that there was no difference in the amount of average damage found on ITEA, Henry's Garnet, or ITEA's Little Henry. Um, both of them will have 30% or more of that plant damaged by red-headed flea beetles if left untreated. Bugilia, we evaluated some Bugilia. We looked at uh, midnight wine and spilled wine with Julia. The difference uh, we saw, and this again, this was in August, uh, early September, uh, we were seeing significantly more damage on uh, spilled wine with Julia versus the midnight wine. Uh, more work would need to be done to determine what some of the differences or reasons why that we think we have a second generation between 1500 and um, 1800 growing degree days. Anytime after that, it's really hard to determine how many generations we have because you start having an overlap of generations, meaning you have at any given time adults, larvae, and pupae active in plants. Um, when we were starting to see another flush of adults, uh, we were seeing uh, Miss Molly butterfly bush in a late stage of bloom, and some of those flowers were already starting to drop off, and the hostas were in full bloom. Um, when we were finding larvae active, or starting to see larvae active in the set for a, what we would consider a potential second generation, we had crepe myrtles and hibiscus in bloom. I'd had a study that was supposed to go all year uh, at a nursery uh, a current and he said he would keep it the plants i was studying in and amongst his but he wouldn't do anything to them so i was like okay that'd be great and so at the end of that we went to evaluate because the only thing that had been done to him was our treatments and we were looking at season-long control and there was no difference between our controls and our treated plants. And he had wondered what, and there was very little damage. He had asked what we had done and what our product was. And when we told him that there was no difference between control and treatments, I asked why he thought, or what he had done to his plants was different. And he had fertilized his plants periodically throughout the year. And so I thought, well, maybe fertility and they like to be in that young growth, maybe that plays a role in post-plant selection. So uh, in 2016 uh, and into 2017, we did a quick study where we grabbed some plants and looked at total nitrogen. And here you can see that uh, Macrophylla 1.27% is nitrogen and it wasn't getting a lot of damage. Limelight, on the other hand, 2.3% nitrogen and it was getting heavily damaged. Hollies, 1.1 and not a lot of damage. Um, although later in the year, they typically can be damaged depending on your species. Salvia, these were the snow white or snow hill, 2.2, uh, 3.4, 3.1% nitrogen. Quick fire foliage, 3.0% nitrogen. Um, other hydrangea paniculata varieties, 1.4, 1.5. So we're letting them believe that maybe fertility could play a role. So we grabbed a number of plants in 2018 and we looked at, um, did a more rigorous evaluation of fertility. Uh, what we found is in all of our samples, the salvia had significantly 
higher amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in, in, the, in the plant. Um, and then Iteus, although it's heavily damaged by flea beetle feeding, is, was lower. Um, macrophylla had less, um, but comparable nitrogen to the quercifolia. I didn't have paniculata in the study, but those samples weren't processed by this time. Um, so it would be interesting to see where the paniculata was. And this is percent nitrogen in there, um, or percent phosphorus, or percent potassium found in the foliage that we sampled. But it got me to thinking that, you know, if a nursery is fertilizing, they may not fertilize these plants all at the same time. They may not get the same fertilizers. So last year, we got um, some cuttings of hydrangea paniculata and then uh, some soilless media that had Osmocote 18.5.12 intermixed with it at two different rates, the maximum rate and then three quarters of that. And then had a soilless media with none, no fertilizer added. We put the uh, cuttings in there and let them grow for three or four weeks, um, probably closer to a month. And then took and put in cages in a greenhouse plants. And we had six plants of each in the in these cages. We had five cages with plants that had three-quarter rate of fertilizer, maximum rate, or none. And then we released 100 beetles in there. Unfortunately, I had to go on a trip, and I wasn't able to evaluate as soon as I would have liked. And by the time the data was taken, all plants had been uh, severely damaged. However, we still saw that the maximum rate fertilized plants had more. It wasn't significant, but there was more damage on those plants. The feeding occurred over five days. And what I would suspect is if we had stopped the feeding after two days, we would have seen a lot of damage on the maximum uh, fertilized plants and less on the other two. The reason why three quarter and none, I believe, are not significant it's because by the time it got to day three or four in that cage, those 100 beetles had fed almost all they wanted off the maximum fertilized plants and they only, they still wanted to eat. And either three quarter or none were the only things left available to them. So they started to feed. So the methodology of this is being worked out, but my gut feeling is, is that there may be some fertility component that plays a role, um, but also probably things like leaf toughness um, or abrasion factors that the insect can have as it's feeding could also play a role. Also plant biases. Now, where are they coming from? Um, and why do I have to keep spraying? Um, are things that we don't know much about and we were going to address some of that early on this year, but due to the fact that uh, we are currently on lockdown, um, some of these projects are going to be postponed to start later in the year, um, but we are looking to have this investigated. Um, weed management definitely could potentially play a role, as I mentioned at the beginning, as they can feed on a number of weed species. So if you have a weedy area next to ITEA, a preferred host, you may get wonderful control on your idea, send those plants out, bring a new crop in, release them thinking you have your flea beetles under control. But if you put it in the same area where that's next to that weedy area, you could have a small refuge of flea beetles in that weedy area that then come out and feed on that preferred host again and then lay eggs in those pots. Does it happen frequently? I'm not really sure, but I suspect it happens more than what we want. And so how far they move, what's their migration patterns like within a nursery, especially since they're small, they move really well on the wind. 
And as you can see in this picture, if you've got a large nursery with no breaks in there, uh, they may be able to move quite far from one host plant to another. And I think that's where some volatiles may play a role. We just don't know. Um, would wind breaks help or we're having, it may. Again, it's just hard to say, uh, but it's an area in which research needs to be conducted. Um, I've applied for grants to work with this pest, but I, one of the frequent comments I get back is, is that it is not an impactful uh, or important enough pest for, the, for us to fund. Um, so we need to make noise to um, grower associations um, so that this gets more notice and that uh, funding agencies realize that it is as much of a concern as the nursery industry knows it is. I'm sure you guys feel that this is a uh, necessary pass to get a rein on in terms of how to control it if you're dealing with it. If you're not dealing with it, congratulations, and I would inspect any favorite host plant that comes in intensely for larvae and root masses for sure. Uh, so that you avoid opportunities to bring it in onto your property. Because once you have it, it's hard to deal with. I don't know if adjacent field crops play a role in spreading into um, nurseries. Corn industry did not, or field crops, looking at corn, they deemed redheaded flea beetle to be a pest that did not warrant treatment because it did not affect yield. For us, it is affecting you. It's affecting how many plants we can sell to landscape contractors or to have them sold to another, a retail nursery. Um, it is affecting our yield and we're trying to control it. There's just a lot of unknowns for the behavior and biology of this past. Natural enemies, other than the entomopathogens I've worked on, not really sure what is healthy keeping its numbers suppressed. Um, we found some parasitoids last year, but we're not sure from what it was exactly isolated from, so that work is continuing as well. We want to stop them. If it's a possibility, we want to stop them from migrating. It's just work that needs to be teased out. With that, I know I'm getting close to my hour, or I'm probably there, um, but I just wanted to throw this out as a potential phenology activity range for the insect to where we probably have eggs in the pots, which is this yellow, and this is for mid-Atlantic. Um, the yellow would be the egg stage. The white would be the larval stage where June, or the red, would be where you would have uh, adults active. Um, I was talking to people in Virginia last year and they were saying they were having adult activity all the way into Thanksgiving. Um, one grower told me he had it into the first week in December in his uh, covered houses. And so, and he was in Southern Virginia. So activity can definitely be long lasting and so we need to try to get something that will work. Some soil systemic insecticides that could play a role, safari, um, mainspring potentially, celebrate more work needs to be done with those and hope to do that uh, sometime this year. Uh, I had some field trials from last year. We're still processing or working out because we evaluated them a little bit different uh, this past year, um, but it looks like Hachi Hachi can provide some control. It just is variable. So host plant and product may have an interaction there as well. Again, we just don't know. Um, some of the chemical companies that have provided help, there's been a number of nurseries in Virginia, New Jersey, and Maryland. Um, the North Carolina State's not on here, but obviously I got another picture of the larvae from Matt Patone on here, so NC State, Virginia Tech, uh, Purdue, Michigan State, um, Tennessee, all have been providing me information, uh, Alabama, Georgia, uh, South Carolina, uh, Clemson, uh, been really good at 
trying to share this information and get a handle on this. Um, it's just everybody needs the funding to be able to help get this work done. I thanks uh, for your time and attention. Uh, to listen to me ramble on about uh, Redhead Flea Beetle. I hope there were some useful nuggets of information in there for you. And again, um, if you contact NC State, they'll share with you my contact information if you wanted to email me. Uh, I'm willing to try to answer questions that I get. But again, thank you, and I hope everyone is doing well. Thank you very much, Brian. Sorry I went over. <laughs>